All right, so here's our third part of our lecture over the nature of molecules and the properties of water. So parts one and two, we talked about elements or atoms. We talked about protons, neutrons, electrons. As I stressed or tried to stress in the first several lectures, focus on the electrons and how the electrons are positioned in those orbitals. The octet rule is going to be incredibly important. So I'm just re-emphasizing this. Make sure you guys, if right now you're saying, what does he mean by octet rule? Go back to the first lecture. Look at that. Pause right now. Go back, lecture one, or part one here, octet rule. That is what will then determine the type of bonding. What are the three bonds that molecules will form? If you're drawn blanks, go back to part two. Run through those bonds. Once you got the bonds under your belt, you understand octet rule, you understand bonding, then you now can get to the properties of water. So it's the hydrogen bond that determines or causes the properties of water. So when we look at water, it is universal to every living thing. All life has to have water. We don't know of anything on this planet that can survive without water, which is why as we explore other planets, we're looking for evidence of water. So right now we're looking at Jupiter's moon Europa because it has water on it. There's evidence that there's water on Europa and it's believed to be salt water. So possible there could be life on that planet, on that moon, underneath the ice sheets in that salt water. Now what will the life be like? We don't know. We can only speculate until possibly we find it. But that's why water is the focus of what we look for when we're studying life is water. The two go hand in hand as the saying goes. All right, so let's look at properties of water. What is unique about water? What makes water so special? So, all right, so the first property of water is water is cohesive. This means it's sticks to itself. So the hydrogen bonds cause it to stick to itself, creating surface tension. So our little insect to the right here, this little guy is called a water strider, little guy there. He is actually standing on the surface of the water. Because of the cohesive nature of water, it creates that tension, which enables that insect to stand there. So the insect's standing there hunting. And when something swims underneath it, it will stab down with its mouth parts, kill the little organism, and consume it. So without that property of water, that insect would not have evolved that ability to hunt in that environment. Water is also adhesive, meaning it sticks to other molecules. So when you're drinking out of a straw, whether that's iced tea, water, whatever it may be, you're sucking up the water through the straw. It attaches to the sides of the straw as it moves up, creating a thing we call capillary action, and then it comes into your mouth. Now let's apply that to the human body and the bloodstream. As the heart pumps, it pushes blood, which is mostly water, through the blood vessels, and that allows blood to go from your toes, getting pushed back up towards your heart, heart, all the way through your legs, the veins in your legs, back up towards your heart. So that adhesive nature helps water move through different biological systems, like the human body. Think about plants. They suck water in the root system, and it goes all the way to the top of the plant, and then leaves evaporates out the leaf of a plant. So adhesive nature of water enables it to stick to those tubes, whether it's a straw, a blood vessel, or these little tubes in plants to move throughout the body of the organism. A uh, third one is that water has a very high specific heat. So this means it takes a lot of heat or a lot of energy for that heat to go up or temperature to go up in the water. So it absorbs a lot of energy. It's the, let me jump back here, it's the hydrogen bonds here, these bonds right here, let me do them in green. Those hydrogen bonds right there, 
that is what allows water to absorb so much energy or heat before the water actually changes temperature. That's incredibly important for life. Think about our body temperature, 98.6. You go outside and there's a heat index of 103. Your body temperature doesn't just shoot up because all the water in the body absorbs that heat before the body temperature would start to rise. And then hopefully we retain or we remain in homeostasis and our body temperature does not go up because of the other mechanisms in the human body to maintain homeostasis. Okay, other properties. Water has a very high heat of vaporization. In order for it to go from liquid to steam to vapor, 212 degrees on the Fahrenheit scale, 100 degrees on the Celsius scale, that's a lot of energy before you're going to actually change it into vapor. So a huge, huge amount of energy has to get pushed into that water for that to actually go from liquid to vapor to gaseous state. So again, it allows life to live at liquid temperatures. Once it shifts to vapor or gas, life can't survive that. So we see things living in thermal vents where the temperature is at 98 degrees Celsius and life is adapted to that. But if that shifted and now all of a sudden it becomes steam, life's not going to survive there. Uh, check out our penguins. Penguins are standing on an ice floe. And the reason they can stand on the ice flow is ice is less dense, or water is less dense when it's frozen. When the temperature decreases and it moves to that freezing point, the molecular bonds in water actually space themselves out further, causing the solid form to be less dense when frozen. So, pretty simple. Ice floats. Penguins live on the ice. Protects them from predators. They have a home. Ice floats around the ocean. Think about in the Midwest when the lakes freeze in the winter. That ice layer creates a barrier, an insulator that protects everything beneath it. Drill through the ice, you have liquid water beneath that's at a warmer temperature than the air above it. So being less dense when the water is frozen is a very simple principle, but a very, very important one for a lot of life on this planet. So the concern is, as climate change continues, Earth's average temperature continues to rise, this ice continues to melt and doesn't refreeze, we're adding a lot of fresh water to the ocean, to the Earth, from the frozen form to liquid, these penguins are going to lose their habitat, polar bears are losing habitat, etc., Huge changes because the Earth's average temperature is creeping up a little bit every year. So climate change is going to continue to significantly alter environments. Environments in the polar regions of the Earth are the ones that are going to be impacted most quickly. Because as soon as we tip past that 32 degree point, that ice starts to melt, habitat changes very, very fast very quickly and very radically. All right, other properties of water. Water acts as a solvent. So you throw anything in water and water becomes, or water is a solvent. The stuff you threw in there, solutes, solid stuff, water can actually break it apart depending on what it is. So now let's circle all the way back to our sodium chloride. Talked about this in the last lecture. What kind of bond is there between the sodium and the chloride? So right here, what kind of bond is holding that sodium to that chloride or this one or this one? That bond is broken when it's presented with water. Water forms these hydration shells around the sodiums and around the chloride ions. It literally rips apart the sodium chloride bond because, again, that's a weak bond. Look it up. What kind of bond is it? 
can't remember it, go back to the lecture two, what bond is broken here, and then the water wraps around sodium, keeps it away from the chloride, and creates salt water. <clears throat> now if the water evaporates, sodium chloride comes back together. It rebonds because, hey, water's gone. I might as well bond with somebody to create the octet rule. Sodium and chloride get back together. The last major property of water to mention here is that water forms ions. Or we could say, oh, let me move it down here. I'm on a space there. Water ionizes. So as it busts apart, it goes through ionization or ionizes. So the H2O breaks apart and creates a hydroxyl ion, which is an OH, and then a hydrogen ion, which is simply an H. So <laughs> this happens randomly, sporadically, periodically, and it creates hydroxyls and hydrogen ions. Now again, these guys are floating around. They're not happy. They're not satisfied. They don't have the octet rule complete. So they're always going to be looking for, ooh, can we rebond to each other? Can we bond to somebody else? How do we achieve that octet rule we all want here? The ion ionization is the last major property of water. When water does this, and it doesn't matter if it's just water by itself or water in a solution, Pepsi, Mountain Dew, coffee, blood, urine, saliva, everything that contains water can ionize, it creates or sets up the pH scale. Now the pH scale is a measure of how much hydrogen ion you have your hydrogen ion concentration. How many do you have? So it's a ratio. Something I'm gonna stress here, chemistry will go back over this. The pH scale works on the power of 10. So as you move from one level to the next to the next, you're changing by the power of 10. Scales in a measure of zero to 14. So every solution has a measure, has a pH somewhere between zero to 14. If you are zero to 6.999, etc., what are we gonna consider you? Acid or acidic. If you are at 7.0, exactly, dead center, then you are considered neutral. Not a lot of things are truly neutral. If you are above at 7.00, 7.001, up to 14, then we consider you basic. All right, so every solution has a pH. Life exists within these little pH ranges. And if we shift out of the pH, that's bad. That's incredibly, incredibly bad. So biologically, we have these things called buffers that act to balance pH. Oops, let me move. Looks like I'm getting cut off. There we go. So a buffer is something that will help regulate pH. It may absorb hydrogens or give off hydrogens. It may absorb hydroxides or give off hydroxides. Basically, it's bonding to those elements to alter the pH and shift it into the normal, the range that should be kept in. So we'll talk about pH more in lab when we get into some of the chemistry stuff, but make sure you're comfortable with the ranges. Look at some examples of things that are on the scale here. So you consider where the urine, body urine is in the sixes, it's slightly acidic. Consider, um, where tomatoes are at, or stomach acid. Whew, stomach acid is crazy acidic, down in the twos. So if you're at a two versus a four, you are actually 100 times more acidic when you're at the two versus a four, power of 10. All right, so we'll touch on chemistry a bit more when we get into some of the other areas of the semester, but definitely make sure you guys are comfortable with the pH scale.